morning. How y'all doing today? Great? Great. Are y'all excited? Y'all ready for a cookout? All right, ready? Amen. Let's go. No, I'm just kidding. They'd like freak out if I sent everyone out right now. They'd be like, oh, we haven't finished cooking yet. But hey, we're, we're going to get to that after we dig into God's Word. And I just wanted to say, hey, I'm so glad you guys are here today. I hope you guys in, enjoy the time as we spend time together here um, digging into God's Word. But then as we take that time of, of food and, and some fellowship outside afterwards, I really hope you guys enjoy it. And hey, we're in the final week of divine disruptions. Now, now during this series, we've been looking at these disruptions in Jesus' ministry. Uh, back in week one, we looked at the, the centurion soldier um, who had come to Jesus, and Jesus was actually amazed by his faith. And, and when you think about that, Jesus, who knows, and knows everything, was amazed by this centurion's faith, and he was his outsider. He, he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't, you know, he was basically considered an enemy of the Jews. And, and Jesus found his faith amazing. And then in week two, we kind of looked at the, we looked at the story of the four friends lowering their, their friend with leprosy through the roof. And they had to tear off the clay or they had to tear off the roof. And, and in order to do that, even in our own lives, we need to tear off this clay or this roof of our sinful flesh because it prevents us from seeing and hearing Jesus, just like the roof in that story prevented them from seeing and hearing Jesus. And then last week, we looked at this woman who was an outsider. She was a Canaanite woman. She was from a, uh, a group of people that was supposed to be wiped out by the Israelites, and, and here she came to Jesus and and at first, it looked like Jesus ignored her, um, but then we find out again he was testing her faith. And, and once her, he saw her faith, and her faith was again stronger than most people in Israel. And, and you know, so we've been looking at these, and, and this week we're going to look at a little different uh, story and kind of dealing with our own life and things that we go through. You know, unfortunately, in, in this world today, and I say it unfortunately because, you know, we all run into the same problem. We, we live in this society that is instant. We, we can get things done right now. And we kind of do the same thing when it comes to Jesus when something's going wrong. You know, it's like, hey, I just got a bad doctor's report. Jesus, heal me. Why didn't you heal me? And we get this, you know, we want things done now. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at today is how God's timing is different than our timing. His timing, he sees the big picture where we may only see what we want to see for our own future, you know, or the results that maybe we want, because sometimes it's just easier if we do what we want and we get what we want. Correct? Is it easy when you get what you want? Come on, I know the ladies are looking at the husband saying, you better get me what I want. <laughs> Otherwise, that's when the fight's going to start and we're going to be going seeing Pastor Ken. All right? But the reality is it's not always like that. And, and sometimes it, it may get frustrating. And, and kind of the big idea today is that we need to understand that Jesus' delays, his delays in, in responding to a request happen so that he can show his power in an even more amazing way. Because ultimately, there are delays. Can he do it? And are there times you pray and bam, it's done? Yes. But how many times have we prayed? And maybe we've been praying for years and we're still waiting. That, that delay doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that he doesn't like us. It, it, it's so his power can be in more of an amazing way. And, and along with that, hopefully we can learn to, to trust in God's timing and patiently wait for him. And that's where the whole problem comes in, that patiently waiting, because, you know, hey, we live in a world where I can just, hey, Siri, I can get an answer. Hey, Google, I can go to Amazon and get it delivered the same day. Just saying, why do I have to wait on Jesus? But with that being said, we're going to be in John chapter 11. 
uh, verses 1 through 16. If you've got a Bible with you, I encourage you to open it up to John chapter 11. If you don't have one with you, there is one in the back of the pew, in the Bible in the back of the pew. You're going to find it on page 1,236. But as always, it will be here on the screen also. And with that being said, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, can I ask everyone to all rise for this hearing of God's word. John 11, 1 through 16. Now a man was sick, Lazarus, from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does not stumble because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. When the, then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus answered, uh, Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So, through the reading of this story and the reading of God's Word, I really wanted to take some time and dig into this this morning because I think we see a lot of ourselves inside this story. And you may be thinking, well, no, I really don't. You may be surprised because ultimately, just like in this story, when it comes to us that, that our plans are often focused on the here and now, it's often focused on what we can do right at this very moment. And think about it, when we go through this life, and how do you react when God's plan for you doesn't make sense? You know, think about it. How do you act when God's plan doesn't make sense? And I know for me, I'm kind of like I start questioning, God, are you sure? You know, is this really, to, you know, to me, hey, I come from a logistics background. You know, if we do it this way, it'll be so much easier, more efficient, and let's just do this. And then God says, no, we're going to do this instead. And it really doesn't make any sense. Or what about if your plans get wrecked? Anyone ever had their plans get wrecked? You, you get this plan and you're like, man, I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to have all this done and, and then something happens and all of a sudden this don't happen and then that next thing doesn't happen and, and then the frustration gets in because it's like, what do you mean? I, I planned this. It was so well organized. Why didn't it work? And, and you think about you know, future plans. We, we always plan for the future. We plan for, hey, you know, uh, we're going to do this. And, and, you know, I remember as a young man growing up, I was like, hey, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have two kids. And, and, and then I'm going to do this as a job. And after I get out of the military, and I'm going to retire from this. And I should only be this old when I do it. I had all these great plans. Well, guess what? I got married, ended up with four kids. The job that I planned on having that I would have already been retired from, I didn't get. So my plans had to change. And I kind of looked back and I'm like, but it didn't make any sense, you know. And, and I got put in a different direction. God's plan for me didn't make sense to me at the time. 
It makes more sense to me now than it did then, but hindsight's always 2020. When we look back, we can see the big picture. When we're looking forward, we, we kind of don't see everything. And we got to remember that God always sees the whole picture. God sees the big picture compared to each one of us. I don't think anyone has ever planned on that we'd never have kids or none of us ever planned a life that we actually have. Maybe we've bits and pieces of it, but not in our entire life because through our life we've all had troubles. We've all had times when things didn't go right. And we never plan for that, but they always seem to happen. We make plans for, to desire for them to happen. And, and like I said, sometimes what Jesus does doesn't make sense to us. But I think when we look deeper into our plans and we look back, we can actually see where, where God has shown up. And, and we're able to say, man, I'm glad I didn't do this. I'm glad I didn't take that path that I was going to take. You know, it's like those unanswered prayers where, you know, you pray and, and then you look back on your life, you're like, man, I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. Whew, I'm really glad he didn't answer that one. And, and as we continue to move forward in our life, we're, we're able to see that God's plans are so much better than ours, even though we don't see it at the moment. And, and that's kind of what you see here. Yeah, we, we desire the here and now. If you look at the undertone of, of what Ma Mary and Martha sent to Jesus, you know, they, they kind of had this, hey, I need you to come now attitude. And you think about it, it's the one whom you love is sick. Now think about it. If you sent a letter to someone or a message, hey, the one that you love is sick, don't that kind of imply, yo, you need to get here? You need to come now kind of thing. It may not actually say it, but it's got this, hey, we need you here right now attitude, and we need you to get here now. Yeah, but we need to understand that, that when our plans are involving these instant answers, they're not always going to line up with what God's got for us. And, and, and as we see this, and you might say, well, Pastor, you know, I don't know about, you know, hey, they were just getting a message out there. Well, the way you actually know that it was implied you need to come now is verses that we didn't read. In verse 21, when Jesus actually shows up, Martha rebukes him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So in other words, you didn't get here on my timing. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. So therefore, you're wrong. Anyone ever feel like that? And don't be looking at your wives. Okay, see, I got someone raising their hand. At least you're smart enough not to go, me. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's when the fight would start. But we all run into that same thing. It's like you, we, we go through this process of I need to get this, and all of a sudden you don't get it, and all of a sudden it's like, God, where were you? And we start to blame God for us not getting what we wanted. We start, well, God, I was doing this for you, God. Well, were you really? Well, God, you didn't answer me right now. Well, ultimately, guess what? He may not answer you right now. And you actually see this with, with the whole the way she basically rebuked him when he didn't show up. She wanted immediate him to go, drop what you're doing, and get here right now attitude and fix her problem. We kind of act that same way, don't we? When, when things aren't going right, all of a sudden you don't feel good. Maybe someone in your family is not doing well. All of a sudden you want Jesus to act now, right? It's like, where are you? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you fixing this? I need you right now. And then ultimately, yeah, and I want to say there's actually nothing wrong with, Lord, I need you right now. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem becomes when we say, Lord, I need you right now, and he doesn't show up when we become angry. The angry part is when it becomes a problem. Wanting him to perform a miracle and heal or do something right now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's the attitude that we take when it doesn't happen in our timing. And that's exactly what you see here when she basically rebukes, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. 
Well, we know Jesus has the power even from the past couple weeks. He didn't even have to be there to heal Lazarus because he didn't have to be there to heal or the demon-possessed girl. He didn't have to be there to heal the centurion servant. He doesn't have to be there to actually do the healing. He's capable of doing it wherever, but that, that attitude of where were you, why weren't you doing what I wanted you to do, because you see what happens is all of a sudden we start acting like we're God and that he's us. And, and that he needs to listen to what we have to say instead of us listening to what he tells us that we should be doing. And, and unfortunately you see this in this same story that we're a lot like him. You, know, you think about it. If Lord, if you're not going to follow my plan to the T then I don't want you to follow it at all. It, it make, it's crazy. Doesn't that sound crazy? But don't we do that? We do that same thing. We do the same thing that we see in here today. And no matter how crazy it sounds, it's, we still do the same thing. We want instant answers. We want God to stop what he's doing and, and answer and give us what we want. Makes zero sense. And it doesn't matter how long you've been walking with Jesus. We all fall into the same thing. We fall into that same trap of, you know, we want it now. Think about it. Have you, have you ever made a plan that involved trouble and suffering? Think about it. Most of us, we, we, we plan something and we want it to be like easy, right? We want it to be easy and comforting and relaxing and, and definitely no pain. But has anyone here ever made a plan to say, you know what, I want to struggle and I want this to be painful for my life? No one? You mean tell me none of you have ever said, Lord, give me cancer and, and let me deal with it for the rest of my life? No one's ever asked for that? What about, Lord... I want to wait till I'm 40 to get married and have kids. No? Sounds kind of crazy, don't it? Because we want that easy way out. We want the, the comfort and painlessness because we don't want any pain in our life. Did anyone in here ever sign up and say, you know what, I'm going to marry this woman or I'm going to marry this man and we're going to be married for a couple years and it's just going to go down the tube it ain't going to go good. Then we're going to have to get a divorce. Well, then, of course, we got a kid involved. So now we got, you know, both of us trying to parent. He's a Disney dad. I'm the mom trying to do everything right. And that's what I signed up for. Woohoo! Did anyone ever choose that life? No? But the reality is we get that life, right? We, we get that life and Disney dad gets to be Disney dad. And, and mom does all the work. And even if it's not a Disney dad and a dad that actually is taking care of the kids and doing what they because I don't want to pick on dads here, okay? So you got a dad who's actually doing everything, and, and the mom's out not doing anything at all. And, and the dad's making sure the kids have clothes or whatever. And, and we never signed up for it, but that's what we end up with. And then we kind of start to ask, Lord, where are you? Lord, how come I don't have the life that I dreamed about as a kid? As a kid, when I was playing and growing up, I knew I was going to do this as a job. I was going to have a marriage. I was going to have these kids. My life was going to be great, and boom. Then it happened. And it turns out to be nothing like I expected. And then we started, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what I asked for. I want that trouble-free life. I want this easy life that, you know, it's just rainbows and unicorns and puppy dogs, and, and I don't ever want it to be bad. But that's not how life works. But as soon as we don't get that life, we start questioning, God, where are you? Well, even better, when God puts us on a path and it doesn't go smooth, we start asking, God, are you sure this is what you want me to do? 
you know, Lord, uh, this will be an easy way out. Can't we go through this door? And meanwhile, he's closed that door because you got to go through some struggling. Maybe you got to go through some hardship. But at the end of the line, you're going to be that much better of a person. Of course, while you're going through it, you don't think so, and you're questioning God the whole time. I mean, e even in this story, we see Mary and Martha questioning, questioning God, trying to get Jesus to come there. They want him there now. And, and even the disciples get into this game. Uh, I love the way the disciples get into it. You know, Jesus tells them, hey, we're going to go back to Judea. And meanwhile, they're like, what? Go back? You know, it's almost, do you know they were about to stone you and kill you there? And now you want to go back. So even the disciples are saying, yo, yo, Jesus, let's just stay away from there. Hey, you can heal him from a distance. Let's not go back. You know, there's hardship there. It means that we're going to have to like fight and argue with people and it's not going to be easy for us to go back to Judea. And do you really, really want to go back? We do the same thing. All of a sudden, it's like you get, the Lord tells you you got to go give someone forgiveness. What? You don't know what they did to me. You want me to go forgive them? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Go forgive them. No. And we put up this argument. We put up this fight back and forth with God because there is no way in the world that I can go do this, God. And God, we can just move on. If we move on, we'll forget about it in time, you know, and, and it'll be easy. We won't have to worry about it no more. And God's like, nope, sorry, we need to go back. And that's exactly what he's telling them here. We need to go back. And, the, and they don't even understand that under, where Jesus tell, talks to them about there's 12 hours of light that he's basically telling them, look, I'm going to be with you, so it's going to be all right. You will be walking with the light, and I will be there. It's going to be okay, and they totally miss it. They totally miss it, the fact that Jesus is going to be with them, that they're going to be okay. They're more worried about what an outcome may be that doesn't fit their criteria of being easy. That, that means we can't do it. We, we can't do this. We can't go that way. We, we need to just avoid going to where we want to go. And we need to understand that God's plan isn't always going to be easy. It's not always going to be an easy plan. It's not always going to be comfortable. And it's not always going to be painless. I think of it like this. You know, when we look at, we want this painless life. And I, gotta, I think about being a parent. Are there any parents in here who would agree, you just need to give your kids whatever they want to make them happy? Didn't think so, right? Because you think about, well, and, and of course, the, the students in the room are like, yeah, you should give me everything I want. It would be so much easier if I could just stay home and you kept money in my bank account. And by the way, I'm 16, so give me a car and don't worry about what I'm doing. That'd be sweet, wouldn't it? Now, remember when we were growing up, that's what we wanted, right? Because guess what? That's the same thing kids want. They want it easy. But giving them everything they want, we already know that doesn't work, right? But just think about it. If we gave them everything that they wanted, where would you put discipline? It couldn't be a factor. So you could never discipline your child. And then you could never have the authority of a parent over the child. But then it's like you've got to have them in order for the kids or your children to know that you actually care. And they need to understand that, guess what? Life isn't always going to be easy. But then what do you hear from your kids at that time when all of a sudden it gets tough and you may discipline them or whatever? You don't love me, right? How many of you ever heard of kids, you don't love me? I've heard it from my kids. I chuckle every time I say it. Uh, I always laughed when I was a kid, you know, when my parents said it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I'd be like, I don't think so. Then I became a parent and I found out actually what they meant because it, does, it did hurt me more than it hurt my kids. But the reality is we, we've got to do that. And then it says, oh, well, you don't love me. And, and I think we kind of get that same attitude when it comes to, to us having troubles. 
when all of a sudden our plan's not working and, and maybe a loved one's sick or maybe you're going through a divorce or maybe, you know, someone in your family passed away, whatever it may be, and, and you're praying, God, heal this, and, and it doesn't happen. All of a sudden you start questioning, well, do you love me? Well, God, do you love me? Or do you even care about me? And we start to get that idea in our head that, well, it must be because, hey, God don't love me, or maybe he don't love the person who's going through it, or whatever it may be, and he doesn't care. And when I first read, I remember when I first read this growing up as a kid, and I got to thinking about, wait a minute. So they asked Jesus to come to heal their brother, and Jesus waits two days. And, and I got to think about it. I looked at the scripture right before, and I said, wait a minute. Right before this, it actually says that Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. And I'm like, this makes no sense. I'm like, if he loved them, why didn't he just get up and go? And... and you know, many times we may think the same thing. Well, that's kind of unloving. That, that doesn't make sense, but love doesn't always make sense. And, and love isn't always easy. And love isn't always what we may think it should be comfortable. Love is also what is best. What is best in any situation is what love is. But we get caught up on love is... Because we think love should be comfortable and make me happy. And, well, technically, love should make my wife happy. And she should be comfortable. And she should feel like I would do anything she wanted her to be done, that I would just do it because I love her. But the reality is, love is what is best. And sometimes what is best doesn't line up with what we may think it is. And that's exactly how Jesus loves us. He loves us for his best. He loves us for his glory and for us to glorify him. But we still get caught up on, I want peace and comfort. I want it to be easy. I, I just want this easy life that I can go on with. And we actually see that you don't see it here. And we don't always see God's plan because God actually sees the big picture. I was reading a book, it was called They Found the Secret. And it's, a, it's actually a PDF book. And in this book, um, V. Raymond Edmond actually tells all these stories uh, of different people, uh, different religious um, people, or just even normal people, that, that they got this secret and they, they got this secret basically kind of like to life and a relationship with God that that was totally different. And, and this one, he's actually talking about Samuel Bringle. And he was a Salvation Army worker in Boston. And he was walking past a, a pub. And there was a drunk inside that actually threw a brick and hit him. And, and the drunk was actually a pretty good shot because he hit him in the head. And Bringle actually almost died from getting hit with this brick. Well, and he spent 18 months in recovery, and, and while he was in recovery, he actually wrote a little book, it's just a little, and it is literally a little book, um, and it's called Helps to Holiness. And, and this book that he wrote actually had thousands of copies published and were sent out to people, and the whole time he's going through recovery, you know, the book's being sold and people are reading it, and, and when he finally gets out and gets back to preaching again, a lot of people came up to him and said, hey, that little book, that little book that you wrote while you're going through recovery has helped me so much. And I love his response. He would always respond by saying this. If there had been no little brick, there, had, uh, there wouldn't have been a little book. And seeing the whole side that here this guy who was drunk picked up a brick threw it at him and hit him in the head, if that wouldn't have happened, the book that changed people's lives would have never been written. And, and seeing the, instead of seeing the, woes me, I got beat, I got, you know, spent 18 months in recovery, I almost died, 
He took that time of solace, of relaxing, just going through recovering and did something to change other people's lives. And instead of being upset, he actually realizes if it wasn't for that brick, there wouldn't have been a book. In some of our cases, some of us are still complaining about the brick. We've been hit by a brick in our life, and that's what we're still complaining about. Instead of moving forward and realizing that God had a bigger plan with that, whatever that brick is that hits you in your head, whatever it is, God's got a bigger plan than just that. But we get so caught up on the negative. We get so caught up on, I can't believe someone did this or whatever it may be, that we can't get past and see the glory of God through it all. And that's exactly what you see in this story. Jesus, instead of going to Lazarus instantly, he waits. He loves them. It says he loves them. He waited. And it was all so that God could be glorified is the reason he waited. So love sometimes waits. It may not seem like it to us. When that brick hits us in the head, the last thing we want to do is wait. We don't want to just sit there. We want it easy. We want to go through this life and just have this easiness to us, but we need to understand that sometimes we have to wait. In this life, there are going to be times that we have to wait. There's going to be times that we have to pause. You know, and I know back when my mom was sick before my mom passed away, having that same question, Lord, why won't you heal her? Pray in that prayer, God, heal her. Saying, Lord, I'm not ready for her to go yet. Heal her. Lord, I'm going to miss her. Heal her. And when I finally got to the point where I could sit there and at the foot of her bed in the hospital, pray, Lord, I ask that you heal her today. Whether it's here on earth or you take her home, I want my mom healed today. About eight, after, eight hours after that prayer, he took her home. Part of me was, really, Lord? That's the part of the prayer you heard? What about healing her here? But at the same time, knowing that, hey, she was healed. She was healed. She was seeing Jesus face to face. And as much as that hurt and as much as I was missing and as much as I questioned at that time and even afterwards saying to myself, I never should have prayed that prayer. It was the right thing to do. Because Jesus' ways are better than ours. God sees the whole picture. We see a little piece. And if he would have healed her here on earth, I would have still had to gone through the same pain at some point later. And it may have been worse. I don't know. He saw the big picture that I didn't see. I can look back now and truly say that I am glad that, and I'm okay with the fact that he took her that day. Because guess what? He healed her that day. He answered my prayer. Maybe not the way I wanted it answered. But man, there's a whole lot of prayers that I prayed that I can look back and I'm glad he didn't answer them the way I did. I remember prayers back when I was like in high school. Lord, if you would just let her go out with me, man, I am so glad. I see her on Facebook now. I'm like, man, I'm glad that didn't work out. See, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But the reality is, at that moment, we're, we're caught in that moment. And we want him, and then we do. Oh, he don't love us. He don't care about us. I can't believe it. Lord, I've done all of this. His plans are bigger than ours. He sees the picture that we don't see. And I always thank him for my unanswered prayers. And we need to remember that love is, is not what is most comfortable 
it is what is best. What is best for us is what love really is. We just miss it because we want to be comfortable. We want it to be easy, but life is never going to be easy. I think about the disciples that whole, what do you mean, you're going back? Has anyone in here ever wanted to just go back someplace where you knew there was going to be a fight? Maybe when I was younger, you know, I didn't care. I was ready to, you know, I was ready to throw before the hat even fell. You know, now I got older, I, I try and avoid that kind of stuff. I try and avoid altercations because I don't like them. You know, and uh, I remind people, you get Pastor Ken or Marine Ken, either way you're going to meet Jesus, it's just how you're going to meet him. And, and, you know, I try and avoid that side of it because I want my life to be easy. But let me tell you, even as a pastor, life isn't easy. Life definitely isn't easy. Life wasn't easy this morning before church. And I chuckle whenever I find that my life isn't easy because I kind of say, all right, Satan, you're trying to get me. You're, you're trying to distract me. You're trying to get me to do something. You're trying to get me to say something. I mean, I, I've bit my tongue so hard in the past that I thought I was going to bleed because I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. I mean, even this morning, I, I get here and I'm setting up out back, and then I come in here, and I'm going to do my final prep for the sermon. I'm like, okay, i got to do my final prep. I've been busy all week long. I've got to sit down and read it, and I get a phone call. And I normally wouldn't answer my phone, but it was my wife, so I knew I had to. So I answer the phone, and she's like, there's a leak in the kids' room. I'm like, what? There's water coming from the ceiling. What? <laughs> So now what I got, I got to stop my sermon prep, and I got to go over there. I got to get a ladder. I got to go up in the ceiling. I'm automatically thinking, hey, we just reinstalled an ice maker. It's probably, you know, because earlier in the week, I flooded Fellowship Hall because I didn't tighten the water line tight enough, and it came off. I'm thinking all this. I'm thinking, oh, no, there's a church going on upstairs. This isn't going to be good. And I got distracted. I got frustrated. I got, I can't believe all this is going on. And then I started thinking, I've got a sermon to give. It wasn't comfortable. Guess what? Life isn't easy. Even for me. Life isn't easy. But I bet all of us wish it was, right? Wouldn't it be nice if just, man, you got up in the morning you didn't even have to turn your alarm off. You just got up. The coffee was already made. Breakfast was made already. Don't know how it got made, but it's made. And you're able to just take time and eat. And then you get on the road and you get on 95 and there's like no traffic. And you're like, oh my God, this is sweet. You know, you're right in that sweet spot. You never got to hit your brakes. And all the lights are green, and you get to work, and your boss is like, hey, good morning. You know what? We're only going to work a half day today, but I'm going to pay you for a full day. And you know what? Hey, we got some coffee or tea for you waiting. Wouldn't that be, like, amazing? Would any of you believe it was really a day? No. Nope. You'd be like, no way. you got to be kidding me. But that's what we want, right? But the reality is, even when we get what's easy, we don't believe it's true. It can't be this easy. But that's exactly what we try and get. We try and get that easiness. We try and get that calmness. But then when it happens, I'd be driving down the road and be like, did the rapture happen and they miss me? Where is everybody? Well, I'd be thinking, man, I must have really overslept. Well, I'd be checking to see what day it is. Easy isn't always the best way to go. Easy isn't always the best. And understand there are going to be times we are going to have troubles in our life. Things aren't going to go our way. But God still loves you immensely. He still cares about you. And he still wants the best for you. And that's that whole thing. He wants the best for you.
we all say we want the best for our kids. We want the best for everyone in our life. But sometimes the best is messy. Sometimes getting to the best is hard. Sometimes it's not always doing what we may want to get to what is best for us. Jesus actually told the disciples in verse 15, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. It's a shocking statement. He's pretty much saying, I rejoice that Lazarus died because you get to see what happens next. It's cr I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. But you think about this, by Lazarus dying and the disciples going with Jesus and realizing that Lazarus isn't just in a deep sleep and needs to be woken up, but that Jesus is actually going to raise him from the dead. The belief that those disciples had to have after that. Man, he just rose him from the dead. And he's been in the grave for four days. Think about that, four days. Probably needed a shower. He'd been in there for four days, knowing he's dead, knowing he's gone, and Jesus brings the disciples there, and the whole reason was why, so God could be glorified. It wasn't about Mary and Martha being happy. It wasn't about the disciples. For the disciples, it was that they would have more faith in Jesus. For Mary and Martha, it was they would see the power of Jesus. And I think about this, everyone there got to see Jesus in a different way. Here, Mary anointed his feet and wiped, her, wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. They've seen miracles, they've seen these different things, but at this level, when it was a loved one, someone that they knew Jesus loved, and, and this is a, in this scripture, is the part with the shortest uh, piece of scripture in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus actually wept at the tomb of Lazarus. So it wasn't that he didn't love him, he didn't care about him, he still had to die, but imagine the people there now. So now you've got the disciples who got to see Jesus in a light they'd never seen him in. They got to see him actually raise someone from the dead. And as big as that was, when Jesus rose from the dead, that was even bigger. When he rose from the dead, it was for our sins. It was for the forgiveness of our sins. That he willingly went to that cross, died, and rose from the grave for each one of us. You see, Jesus focuses on eternal. We focus on what's in front of us. We focus on the now and the here. We need to stop looking at the little picture and see what God sees with the big picture. You know, I can only imagine, say a reporter was there, and after it was all over, went up to Mary and Martha and said, hey, you know, we, we know you called Jesus to come right away. And he waited two days. Would you change anything about what happened? Do you think he still should have came early? And, and, and of course, this would be all speculation. But I'm sure that response would be no way. Jesus showed up and his timing was perfect. He raised my brother from the dead. I wouldn't change a thing. What about the disciples? Okay, hey, disciples, would you change anything? No. Dude, did you see he raised this guy from the dead? That's going to be ingrained in our hearts forever. We're never going to forget this. Dude, we were afraid to come back to Judea, and we came with the master, and we watched him raise someone from the dead. No, I wouldn't change a thing. And I'd come back with the master wherever he brings me to. Now I'm sure Lazarus probably would have to do. My sisters, you know where I was at? 
I was in heaven. Y'all made Jesus bring me back. <laughs> he probably wasn't too happy about it. But I can imagine the rest of them, it didn't matter about the delay. It didn't matter that Jesus didn't come on their timing. It didn't matter that they had to go someplace that they didn't want to go. The end result was God was glorified. God was glorified and they got to grow in a closer relationship to Jesus. They got to see Jesus in a different light than they'd seen him in. We need to do that same thing. We need to take that time to see Jesus in a different light and understand his timing is so much better than ours. His timing is so much better than ours. Jesus' delays in responding to the request happen so he can show his power in an even more amazing way. When there's a delay, just be obedient. Continue to do what he calls you to do. And ultimately trust in God's timing and, and, and patiently wait for him because what he's got planned is so much bigger than ours. His plan is bigger than any of ours. So ultimately, we like the easy road. How many people like the easy road here? How many people, you know, the, my path to the future is the path of least resistance, right? That's kind of what we got. We want the least resistance. We want smooth sailing. And, and here's my path right here. And this is the path I'm going to go. And then all of a sudden something happens. And that path of least resistance becomes too narrow or gets a detour sign in it. And we got to go a different way. When we're called to go that different way, be obedient to what God's calling you to be. And, and as much as I say don't question him, guess what? I still do. I'm a pastor and I still, Lord, are you sure? When it gets hard, I ask, Lord, are you sure you wanted me to do this? And he always reminds me, yes, I got you where I want you. Keep moving. So even through the struggles, I continue to move forward. Because his ways are better than mine. And I want to let you know, if you're sitting here today, and you may be saying, hey, pastor, that's all great, but this whole Jesus thing and this whole, you know, God, and I, I don't understand it, and I've, I've never really accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and, and, and quite honest, pastor, I'm messed up. Man, my life is so jacked up and there's no way in the world that God would ever accept me anyways. And I just came here because you're having a cookout. <laughs> hey, if you offer food, people come. I, anyways. But here's the reality. You can never be too messed up. You can never be too jacked up for our Lord. God's word says we're all sinners and we all fall short. So guess what? You're in good company. The person sitting next to you is a sinner just like you. Just like you. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But yet God showed his love for us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now think about it. Christ died over 2,000 years ago. So he knew you were coming. He knew you were going to be a sinner, and yet he still willfully went to the cross for you because he loved you that much. And as his word says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's the beginning of it. The beginning of that whole, hey, accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, it's taking that step, knowing, hey, I'm a sinner. I fall short. I lived a messed up, jacked up life. But man, I got a God who loves me. I got a God who loves me. 
and his ways are better than mine. So it starts with that, taking that step of obedience. Making Jesus the Lord of your life. Not just saying I invite the Lord into my heart. Make him the Lord of your life. If he is the Lord of your life, then he is your master. He controls what you do. We don't control what he does. So you make him the Lord of your life. And then after that, you take that next step of baptism, of that obedience of, of baptism through immersion. Baptism does not save you. It's an outward sign of that inward profession of faith. And you take those steps. Accept Jesus, get baptized, and then start to live your life for him. That's the hardest part. Living your life for him. Because the reality is that when you leave here, guess what? Your family is the same. Your friends are the same. Your co-workers are the same. The difference is going to be you. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and he starts working on you and that sin that you have, he starts to bring to the surface so that you want to repent and move away from it. That's when life gets real. That's when it gets hard. That's when Satan's going to come in and tell you, guess what? You're going through this because he doesn't love you. You're going through this because he don't care about you. And ultimately, you got to remember, he loves you enough to wait. He loves you enough to wait. Because we have to make that decision. He will never make you do something that you don't want to do. Now you might say, well, that's crazy. Ultimately, we have free will. It's our decision how we live our life. It's our decision if we make him the Lord of our life. It's our decision if we walk away. It's our decision each and every day what we do but remember, he loved you enough that he died on a cross for you. And sometimes his delay is because he loves you that much. He loved Lazarus. He waited two days. How long has he been waiting for you? Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you continue to do in our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you that there's times that you wait. You know, Lord, we want this immediate, come and do it. Hey, I, I ask for it. Give it to me now. But Lord, now isn't always the right time. Now may not always be in your plan. So Lord, help us to be patient. Help us to see you for who you are. Help us to obey you even in the delay. But help us to, to see you and to see the picture and the view that you have. Because, Lord, you see the big picture. Lord, the only time we see it is when we look back into our past and we can see where you showed up. Help us to just know that you want good for us. You want what is best. And Lord, sometimes to be good, it takes that feeling of not being good. Sometimes we've got to go through things to get to where you want us to be. So Lord, help us to be who you called us to be. And Lord, make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, 
definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com. And on the very front page, you say, give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.